Amen. Tomorrow is uh, Memorial Day, and we always think of Memorial Day as like the start of the summer. Kennywood opens, you know, and we go camping and have picnics and everything, and those things are really good. But I hope that, and I always try to remind us that when we have these holidays, they have a reason for being there. In every uh, little town and every village and just everywhere all over the United States, if you go into these towns, you'll see somewhere there will be a, a, a granite monument or a limestone monument uh, or a plaque with names on it. And uh, they're names of people who have served in the armed services and gave their lives uh, in, in whatever war, whether it be uh, Vietnam or you know, Iraq or Afghanistan or Korea or World War II or World War I. Uh, we like to commemorate, we like to put markers at times and places and things to remember people. If you go to Washington, D.C., the Vietnam Memorial with all the names. Uh, if you go to uh, a place called Bedford, Virginia, there's a place there where it's a D-Day Memorial. Rose and I have been there a few times, and they have all the names of the people who died in that. And when we were in Germany, we went to places, and we saw they have their monuments. We like to put markers. And the reason we like to do that, because God does that. God puts markers. Uh, if you read through the Old Testament, manna, uh, the, the blue ribbon around the, 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 uh, the, the clothes of the Israelites, the, the stones on the, on the shoulders of the high priest, they all represented something. They were all a memorial. Uh, all the feast days, all the, uh, the sacrifices, they all were a memorial of something <laughs> to remind the people of something God had done or some blessing God had given to them. Uh, the Passover Seder, which Jesus celebrated on the night he was, uh, before he was crucified, was a memorial. And whenever we take communion, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So all through the Bible, we see God setting up markers, places where we could look back and say, I remember when God did this then. Of course, our greatest memorial is the cross. Uh, some people think the cross is a piece of jewelry, an emblem, a good luck charm, just something to wear that looks cool. But to us, it's, it's the symbol of what Jesus did for us. It's the symbol of Christ shedding his blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And that, that symbol, we look back to the cross. We look back to that and we say, this is where my life began. This is where my, my future began. When I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the for forgiveness of my sins. And that's the greatest marker, I think, for us as believers. Uh, in the history of our nation, now, when we were in Germany, many of the young people over there speak English, and they speak it very well because they're taught it in school. <laughs> and uh, when we were uh, in, at the wedding reception, it was an 11-hour wedding reception. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we'll talk about that Wednesday night. It was fun. They had things going on, you know. But... This one young man, we were speaking, and uh, he had asked me, he said, did you hear what Barack Obama said about same-sex marriages? And we had not heard anything. For the first week and a half, we didn't have a TV. We didn't have Internet access. It was wonderful. I didn't, I didn't hear the news for a week and a half, and I was real happy. I mean, that was fine, you know. But when he asked me that, I said, well, I had not heard that. I said, but it, did, it does not surprise me that he would say that. And we got talking about the United States. And I think of the, 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 the markers and the memorials uh, in our nation. If you, if you read, if you get on the Internet and you look up the very first inaugural speech. Now, who's the first president of the United States? Does anybody know? <laughs> who, who, who is it? George? What? George, the, the guy on the $1 bill, right? $1 first president. Okay. He was, the, he was the first president, and when he was inaugurated, if you can go on the internet and you find his inaugural address, basically what he said, and I'm not going to try to quote it or read it because they used a lot of long words and long sentences back then, but here's what he said. He said, if it weren't for God, we wouldn't be here. Now, whether George Washington was a born-again Christian, he was a Freemason, I, you know, I'm not going to say that, but that's what he said. If it weren't for the power of the Almighty, the United States wouldn't exist. He said that. And after he said that in his speech, he went to a local church and he prayed. And he asked God.
to bless America. Now, do you know where that happened? It wasn't in Washington, D.C., because it hadn't been built yet. It wasn't in Philadelphia. But the first capital of the United States was New York City. And when he gave his inaugural address, it was on the steps of the federal building, which is still there. And when he prayed, he went to a place called St. Paul's Episcopal Church, which is still there. And you know where that church is located? Right on the corner of Ground Zero. When all the destruction and, and, and all the mess that happened when they flew those planes into the World Trade Centers, all that destruction, God spared that church. And I believe he spared it as a reminder. He said, this is where your first president asked me to bless you. Now, have, you, have, have, have I blessed you over the last 250 or years, as, however long it's been? And, and have you blessed me? You see, when a nation begins to turn their back on God, God has ways of reminding us. And a place that we have visited many times in Romans chapter 1, I'd like to ask you to turn there with me. Because when that young man asked me about what Barack Obama had said and about same-sex marriage, here's what I said to him. I said, the same-sex marriage people, that's not the problem. Corruption in government is not the problem. Corruption in, in business and wealthy people, that's not the problem. Those are just symptoms of the problem. And I told that young man, I said, if you want to know about what's happening in the United States of America, read Romans chapter 1. Because it's like a road map of what has happened in the last 50, 100 years. And we want to start with verse 16. The Apostle Paul writes to the Romans. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, it's sad to say that many churches are becoming ashamed of the gospel. They're becoming ashamed of the cross. The good news that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners like me, they're, they're becoming ashamed of it because to be able to tell the good news, you've got to tell the bad news first. And the bad news first is that I'm a sinner and I'm dying, I'm going to hell. That's bad news. But folks don't like to hear that. You know, the people that began what we call the seeker-sensitive movement, you know what they did was they went out into communities and they took a survey. And they said, why don't you come to church? And they found out that a lot of people didn't come to church because when I go to church, they make me feel guilty. So they said, we'll just stop making them feel guilty. And a lot of them said, why, well, I, I don't go to church because it's, it's, uh, it's boring. So they said, well, we'll just, we'll just have music and we'll make it like going to the movies. So they, they started to have church in a way that would attract people, but they bypassed, they become ashamed of the gospel. They've taken the crosses off the wall. And instead they try to kind of go through the back door. They become ashamed of the gospel. I wonder how many of us, and I've asked myself, how many times have I been in a situation where I've kept my mouth shut when I should have opened it and said something about Jesus? Shame to the gospel. Just like what Peter did on that night that Jesus was crucified. He said, I don't know him. Uh, not me. I've been there. I put my hand up. Don't no, anybody think I'm pointing a finger at you. Listen to what he says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, why? For it's the power of God unto salvation. Nobody's going to get saved unless they hear about the cross. You can't get saved unless you hear about what Jesus did on the cross. Unless you see a picture of an ugly Jesus hanging on the cross. That was a picture of our sin. That's the only way that we can get saved. It has to begin there. Yes, there's blessing. Yes, there's holiness. God can do so much for us. But it has to begin with that ugly recognition that I'm a sinner. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. You're, you're not going to learn about God anywhere else than by reading about what he did when Jesus died on that cross. It says in Isaiah that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God did not weep when Jesus hung on that cross. 
It was pleasing to him that his son was willing to humble himself unto death so that we might have eternal life. That's the gospel. He says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to live by faith. I, want to, I don't see everything the way, it, the way it's going to be, but I believe that what this word tells me is true. I live by faith. I can't prove it scientifically. I can't, I can't point to this. I have never physically seen Jesus Christ, but I believe by faith he is who he is and that he did what he did. It goes on and it says this. For the wrath of God... The wrath of God. God is love, right? I mean, God doesn't get mad, does he? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. You know, God does not work in mysterious ways. He reveals what he does. And he reveals how he feels about things very clearly and without any confusion. He lets us know what he thinks is right, and he lets us know what he thinks is wrong. Now, let me put that differently. He lets us know what is right and what is wrong, (laughs) because what he thinks is. He says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. People who hold back, they don't want to believe the truth. They don't want to preach the truth. They want to silence it because when we start hearing the truth of God, it makes us realize that we are not God. And mankind throughout history, throughout the centuries, has always tried to overstep the authority of the Holy One. From the Tower of Babel? No. From the Garden of Eden? Until now. Man has always tried to lift himself up above the Lord. It says in verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. There is no excuse. Listen, if we just look at the at very nature, how can we think that there is no God? If you can, if you can look at, uh, just sit on your front porch. You know, Rose and I, we like to sit on our front porch. And we look at these birds. We put bird seed out for the birds, okay. And these birds come, and they're all different. You know, they're different, different species of birds. And they have, they have the way they interact with each other. And, 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 they, and they just automatically know that it's time to start picking up pieces of hay to go build a nest. They automatically know. You can see when the little boy birds are trying to attract the little girl birds. Yeah. You know. they, have that, they have that dance. You know, they, they hop around and their feathers go up. And it's, it's, it's just like it's what they know. It's, it's programmed in. If you look at nature and you look at animals and you look at all the species, things are programmed in. It just, it, 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 it's, already, it, it's just the way it is. God programmed them that way. How can we think that it just sort of evolved over a couple trillion of years that these things act the way they do? It's evident in, in very nature. That the more that we learn about the makeup of the human being, you know, the, the cells and how all the, different, all the different organs work together. How could this happen by accident? What the Word tells us is very nature tells us there's a God. It's evident. The, our founding father says these truths are evident. They're there. Because that which may be known of God, in verse 19, is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They try to explain it away. If I've, I've, I've done a presentation called Science Falsely So-Called, some of you have seen it or heard it, and it's it's how they try to explain away the beginning of the universe. You ever, ever read about that? Or, you, you know, they came up with the Big Bang Theory. You've heard that, right? And you, you know why they came up with that? Was there some kind of scientific discovery that they were... No. Here's why they came up with the Big Bang Theory. In the late 1920s, Edwin Hubble, they named the telescope after him, he discovered, you know what he found out? 
by measuring and by observing, he found out that everything is moving apart from each other in the universe. The universe is expanding. Well, when he found this out, it caused some problems. Because if everything is expanding, that meant at one time it must have been all together. And, and when they found that out, they said, oh, that means there was a beginning. That means there must be a, a create. Oh, no. And, and it said, uh, uh, some of these modern-day scientists said the scientists of those times, they just ignored that because they didn't want to come to grips with the idea that it had a beginning. And now they've got all kinds of crazy. They came up with a big bang theory. Well, it must have just had a big explosion one time. A bunch of nothing just exploded into the universe. There's no scientific evidence. They just, listen, they are willfully ignorant. They are without excuse. They should come to the conclusion that, yes, there is a supreme being that created everything that exists in the universe. Instead, they have to come up with something else because they just don't want to bow their knee to God. Listen to what he says in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, listen, they knew God. Everybody has something in them that tells them there's a God. That's why there's religion all over the place. You can go to the deepest, darkest jungle in some island that nobody has ever been there, and they've got some kind of religion. Because there's something inside the human being that said there's something bigger than us. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. This is the story of mankind. This is the story of the United States of America. This is why we're, we are where we're at. This is why we're struggling with the economy. This is why we're struggling with issues of same-sex marriage. Could you just imagine going up to uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and saying, uh, <clears throat> we wonder if, if uh, we could in introduce an amendment saying that uh, we can have same-sex marriage. But we've got to the place where we just think, well, hey. And see, and we'll, we'll make the mistake of looking at the people who are involved in that and thinking they're the enemy, but they're not the enemy. They've believed the lie. They need to hear the truth. We need to pray for them. When Rose and I were coming back on the plane, <laughs> about two seats in front of us, there was a couple. And I looked at them, and I don't know, maybe they were on their honeymoon, I don't know what. But I said, we need to pray for them. You know, two, two young men who were. So we need to pray for them. They're not the enemy. They believe the lie. They're the victims. The problem isn't gay marriage. The problem isn't economy. The problem isn't corruption. The problem is we've turned our back on God. As a nation, as a people, we have tried to eliminate the, th the idea of God out of our public consciousness. If you want to have religion, that's your business. Go ahead, you do it on Sunday morning. Keep it to yourself. But our founding fathers, whether they were saved or not saved, I don't know. But they acknowledged the fact that there was a, a, a supreme being. That's why in our revolution we didn't have the, the, the guillotine. Okay. In the French Revolution, if you know your history, the French Revolution, that was a godless. Those people, they didn't believe in any god. They had the guillotine. Anybody disagreed with them, off with the head. That's why we didn't have that here. Because we had people that believed that there's a supreme being that said, said some things were right and some things were wrong. It's reading on a little bit more. It said, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, because of that, 
Because they've, they turned their back on God. Because of instead of worshiping a supreme being uh, who is in charge of everything, they've instead put man, has put himself in the place of God. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It's a symptom. It's not the problem. It's the symptom. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen what's happened in our nation and really what's happening all over the world is men and women, mankind, has decided we don't need to worship a God. We don't need to have a supreme being. We don't, we don't need a savior. We can save ourselves. We can take care of ourselves. We can deliver ourselves. We can be our own defense. We can be our own. You know, we have a mighty military. They'll defend us. Well, they couldn't stop three jet planes from flying into towers and into the Pentagon. With all the military might in the world, if God wants to send judgment, he can do it in the bottom of a shoe if he wanted to. You see, we think we're so powerful and so great. What a great nation. But our nation is ripe for judgment. It's like the sisters spoke. The time is short. See, when you get on an airplane, I see you have to put up with me because I have all these illusions to riding on an airplane. When you get on an airplane and the pilot comes on and says, we've got some turbulence coming up, put on your seatbelts. Man, we need to put on our seatbelts. Because turbulence is coming. It's, it's, it's here already. It's not going to get better. We as believers need to anchor our faith. We need to get our feet planted on solid ground. We need to quit playing with the world. We need to quit being halfway over here and halfway. We need to make a decision. We need to choose this day who we're going to serve. Because we're going to be challenged in every corner of our lives about who we are and who we worship. It says they changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Verse 26. For this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. You know, when we were coming back on the flight, they were shown a movie, okay, up in the, up in the front. And if, if you wanted to, you could get a pair of earphones and listen to the movie, but we didn't. But I couldn't help but watch. We're sitting right there in this movie. I don't even know what the movies were. But one... Had these, had like demons flying around. And, and they had, it wasn't Harry Potter, but it was kind of like it. They had kids, you know, that were like fighting the demons. I'm thinking, that's glorifying the devil. This is what, this is what we're watching. This is what we're listening to. The music that, these, the, that people are listening to nowadays is devilish and demonic and, and it's, come on, you know, it's loud. And, and we wonder why our kids are falling away more and more and more. We wonder why adults are falling away more. But, but people that we once thought were solid, you know, in the word and solid Christians are falling away into all kinds of stuff. We wonder why the divorce rate in the church is as high as it is in the world. We wonder why the use of pornography and, 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 and child pornography is, is almost as high amongst people that identify themselves as Christians as in the world. Why? Because we've given ourselves over. We no longer want to stand and say, look, I'm a Christian. I can't do that anymore. I'm a believer. I can't go there anymore. I'm, 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 I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I can't put myself in that position. No, we want to have it both ways. We want to have it nice on Sunday morning and just go ahead and do what we feel like doing on, on Monday evening. But the time is coming. We need to fasten our seatbelts. Somebody says... Maybe you should have stayed in Germany another week. I don't know. All right. <laughs> and likewise, verse 27, also the men, 
Verse 26, for this cause God gave them unto their affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. You know, there's a place, there's a time when God's going to say, all right, Go ahead. Have your fill. I'm reminded of the story when the children of Israel were coming from Egypt to uh, the promised land. There was a time when they said, we would like to have meat. Actually, there were two times. The first time they said, we would like to have meat. So God said, all right. And he sent a wind and he gave them quail. Don't ask me the exact chapters where this is. It's in the book of Numbers. He gave them quail, and they ate the quail, and they had meat, and God gave them manna. But then there was another time later when they started complaining. After God was going to allow them into the promised land, and they refused to go in because they said the giants in the land and so forth, there was another time, and they said, we want meat. And God said, I'll give you meat. And he gave them quail, and it says that they they ate so much it was coming out of their nostrils. And God sent a plague because of the lust after the things of the world. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, in verse 28, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, a disqualified mind, to do those things which are not convenient. Now listen, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. Now, see, now we're getting some areas that we get to get a little, you know, get a little touchy with us. Because some of those things, you know, I would never do that. I would n- never do that. But covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, Backbiters, haters of God, dis- despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, verse 31. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. All these things are just symptoms of a nation that has turned its back on God. Of a people who no longer want to retain God in their knowledge. They're tearing down the Ten Commandment plaques. People get up in arms. I've said this before. I wonder how many people who are upset about that really even know what the Ten Commandments say. Or even if they do know what they say, do they care? Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You see, We came back to the United States after being in Germany, and I thought to myself, I said, you know, it's just the thoughts that went through my head. 60 years ago, 70 years ago, my father probably fought against some of their fathers and grandfathers in a war that was not my war. And I I thought I didn't bring I didn't bring the topic up, but they would talk about as Ralph was driving us around, he was telling about like the, when the, Germany was occupied and, and so forth in World War II. And, but I thought to myself, how things have changed. Because in World War II, there was a madman named Hitler who was destroying, he wanted to eliminate, he wanted to eliminate all the Jews, he called it the final solution. And he wanted to eliminate all those who were mentally ill and and those who were not, uh, you know, uh, viable in their society. And he sold that to the people of Germany. And we think, oh, how horrible. But I want to tell you the same thing is happening right now, right here. And God says, you remember when your first president asked me to bless your country? You remember? Listen, we need as believers to pray for some things. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders that somehow God would get a hold of them 
and save them. And I'm not talking Democrat, Republican. I'm, I'm not across the board. I don't want anybody to accuse me of being political because I'm not. But we need to make a decision as believers that we will not be moved. And we need to make a decision that we're going to say, Lord, show me myself in the light of your word. Before you show me anybody else, you know, we like him to show us others. <laughs> but before you show me anybody else, show me, my, show me myself in the light of your word. That whenever the turbulence comes, my seatbelt will be buckled. I'll be ready for it. When, when the troubles come, when it seems like everything is, is working against the body of Christ and the church of God, I can stand firm and remember what Jesus said. He left a, a monument. He left a marker. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I don't care who's president or vice president. I don't care who's on the Supreme Court. It doesn't matter because we're going to stand on God's word. Go ahead and shut the places down. It doesn't matter. The, the church will grow faster than it's ever grown. Go ahead and legalize what legalize every sin you can to make a, make a buck off of it. Go ahead. The gospel will go forth stronger than it's ever been. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm glad to be back in the USA. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad I'm an American. I'm not ashamed of being an American. But I'm more glad, I'm more thankful that my, I, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm more thankful for the marker that God set on the cross. And he said this. This is the, the, the blood of the new covenant written in my blood. Because whether it's in America or Germany or Africa or China or wherever it is the blood of Jesus is still able to save sinners and that's what I'm counting on father we pray for the United States of America father we thank you for the men and women who have given their lives over the over the centuries for this nation that we live in we're thankful Lord that we have the freedom to be able to come into a place like this and worship you in spirit and in truth. We're thankful, Lord, that we still have liberties that have not been eroded away yet. We're thankful, Lord, that we have the ability to vote and to, and to uh, express our opinion publicly without fear of retribution. Father, you have blessed us in such great ways when our president, our first president, prayed for blessing. You have blessed America. You have blessed America. But now you want to remind us and you want to say, I blessed you. Now, come. Are you, gonna, are you, are you willing to come? My arm is still open. I'm still, I'm still seeking. I'm still asking. I'm still, I'm still bidding you to come to my table. Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to turn from your wicked ways? Oh, Father, as you speak to the church today, not just to this one, but to every congregation, to every body of believers, are you willing to forsake your wicked ways and turn to me? Anchor yourself on my word. Father, I pray that you will indeed bless our nation. Father, we thank you so much that we're Americans. and We have all have different uh, histories. Our, our families have come through different ways. But we stand here today. We're together today, even as that song says, praising your name. Father, we thank you and we give you glory. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, won't you stand? Oh, beautiful for spacious skies for amber waves of grain